we're going to read some samples from the diary of Cotton Mather. 1691, a fragment found too late to be inserted in regular order in the volume. This day was with me a day of singular distress. My father was now on board a ketch, which attended him to meet the ship, wherein he was to take his voyage for England. This day the ship was to set sail, and I understood that my father's enemies with other vessels, which had armed men in them, were to accompany that ship till clear of the coast, that so he might have no opportunity to get on board. All the time of my father's absence in this difficulty and obscurity, I kept wrestling with God for his preservation. Many psalms had I prayed and sang with a particular application to this affair, especially Psalm 27, 56, 57, 59, 64, 121, 140, and 142. But this day I set apart for prayer with fasting before the Lord. I humbled and loathed myself before God for my former iniquities and my present infirmities. I confess my unworthiness of all mercies, and especially such a mercy as the enjoyment of such a father as mine. I implored of the Lord once and again that he would this day deliver my father from his adversaries. The fresh accounts which were in the midst of the day, brought me about the perils now surrounding of my father, produced in me such a distress that I cast myself prostrate on my study floor, and there, with my mouth in the dust, I begged for my father's deliverance, promising that I would within a few days keep a day of thanksgiving unto God if I might obtain it. My spirit was, after this, at some ease about this perplexing affair, but I thought myself concerned, Further to entreat, that since my father had now left me alone in a great place and in a great work, yet that I might not be alone or be destitute of those assistances from God, without which I must needs dishonor him, which was to me the dreadfulest thought in the world. And the Lord assured me that he would be with me. Well, at night the gentleman, my father Phillips, the principal, who had undertaken for the safety of my father, arrived home and came to tell me that my father was beyond the reach of all ill men, put aboard the ship intended through the wonderful providence of God, causing the same wind both to help him and hurt his pursuers. Thus the Lord heard me in the day that I cried unto him, I will love the Lord. This week dreamed that being left alone, I was put upon preaching a sermon publicly for which I had no time to prepare aforehand. I dreamed that being driven to this extemporaneous extremity, I preached a sermon upon those words, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The thoughts which I had upon this text in my sleep were so proper and so lively, and I could, after I awoke, remember so many of them that indeed I preached a Lord's Day following upon that very text. In a week following, I kept a day of secret thanksgiving unto the Lord, as I had promised. The Diary of Cotton Mather March 12th, 1681 This day was filled with the devotions and enjoyments of a raised soul. But there were especially two things in which the sallies of my soul were considerable, not only on this day, but at many other times in this part of my life. One thing in which I was most fervently concerned was that great thing of a closure with the Lord Jesus Christ. In the prosecution of this matter, I may truly say, it was the Spirit of God that was my teacher. No man or book showed me the way of expressing this glorious transaction, but this day I used such words as these, among others, before the Redeemer of my soul. O oh, my dear Lord, thy Father has committed my soul into thy hands. There is a covenant of redemption in which I am concerned. I know my election by my vocation. In my concernment in that covenant, by my being made willing to come under the shadow of thy wings in the covenant of grace. Now in that covenant the Father said unto the Son, Such an elect soul there is that I will bring into thy fold, and thou shalt undertake for that soul as a sufficient and an eternal Saviour. 
Therefore I am now in thy hands, O my Lord. Thy father has put me there, and I have put myself there. Oh, save me. Oh, heal me. Oh, work for me. Work in me the good pleasure of thy goodness. And afterward I said, Lord, I have been leaving my soul this day with Jesus Christ, and thou hast bid me to believe that I shall be saved by him. Lord, I do believe that there never came a poor soul to the Lord Jesus Christ in vain. And I do believe that I myself shall not find it in vain. He will do great things for me. He has already done enough to leave me without any cause of repenting that I have. Through so much agony of soul, come unto him. Yea, but I believe that he has more still to do for me. Having been the author, he will be the finisher of my faith. Another thing that as much exercised me was that I might not be left without necessary supplies of speech for my ministry. At this time, Cotton Mather was assisting his father, Increase Mather, at the North Church. He first preached for his grandfather at Dorchester, August twenty second, 1680, and for his father at Boston on the following Sabbath. He was called to be the assistant to his father on February twenty third. 1680. But I continue. God was pleased so far to let my infirmity remain, that although by a careful deliberation my public services were freed from any blemish by it, yet I was by his wisdom kept in continual prayer and fear and faith concerning it. How many thousands of solicited thoughts I underwent concerning it is best known to him who by those thoughts drove me and kept me near to himself. On this day particularly I pleaded, Lord, thou art he that made man's mouth, and thou wast angry with Moses, because he would not make that consideration an argument for faith. And thou wouldest be with his mouth. And now because I would not so sin, therefore I trust in thee. Thou didst send me forth as thou didst Moses, in service for thy name among thy people. And thou who didst make man's mouth, and make my mouth, wilt be with my mouth. It was also once used as a bottom for faith, the Lord has, and therefore the Lord will. Now it is a blessed experience which I have already had of your help. Yea, such an experience as has caused me to promise that I would never distrust thee more. Lord, thou sayest, none of them who trust in thee shall be desolate. But how desolate shall I be, if I am left without speech for thy work? I trust in thee, and therefore it shall not be. Thou sayest, Thou wilt never forsake them that seek thee. But I have sought thee, and I will seek thee as long as I have a day to live. And now, O Lord, I will believingly wait on thee. I shall see a token for good. Thy people too shall see witness of the token. But one special action of this day was to make and write the following. The following is Cotton Mather's resolutions as to his walk with God. Lord, thou workest in me to will, help me to resolve. As to my thoughts, to endeavor that I will keep God and Christ and heaven much in my thoughts. In a special manner, to watch and pray against lascivious thoughts, ambitious thoughts, and wandering thoughts in the times of devotion. But secondly, as to my words, first, to be not of many words, and when I do speak, to do it with deliberation, to remember my obligations, to use my tongue as the Lord's and not my own, and therefore to promote savory discourse if I can, wherever I come, and to discourse with such as come fairly in my way about the things of their everlasting peace. Number three, never to answer any weighty question without lifting up my heart unto God in a request that he would help me to give a right answer. Number four, to speak ill of no man except on a good ground and for a good end. Number five, seldom to make a visit without contriving what I may do for God in that visit. Number three, is to my daily course of duties first. To pray at least three times for the most part every day. Number two, to meditate once a day in a meditation proceeding after some such method as this, that there shall be two parts of the work, doctrinal and applicatory. 
the doctrinal to be dispatched in an answer to a question, the applicatory to flow from this into examination, expostulation, and resolution. Number three, to make a custom of propounding to myself these three questions every night before I sleep. What has been the mercy of God to me in the day past? What has been my carriage before God in the day past? And if I die this night, is my immortal spirit safe? Footnote. Cotton Mather early adopted the practice of ejaculatory prayer, which Fuller describes as a short prayer darted up to God in an emergency. In this sense, the word was much used at the time this record was written. Back to the narrative. Number four, to lead a life of heavenly ejaculations. Number five, to be diligent in observing and recording of illustrious providences. But in all, to be continually going on to the Lord Jesus Christ is the only physician and redeemer of my soul. Lord, thou that workest in me to do, help me to perform. Pinned by Cotton Mather, a feeble and worthless, yet Lord by thy grace desirous to approve himself, a sincere and faithful servant of Jesus Christ. The Lord knows how miserably defective I have been in the performing of what I have thus resolved. But my defects have been a matter of my continual reflections and abasements before him. And for the main I have made in my study to be abounding in these works of the Lord. Yea, these flights of my soul in essays to glorify God have been but the lower and lesser flights of my youth, which I hope will ere long proceed unto a mounting up with the wings of eagles. The singular assistances which the God of heaven gave unto me in my public ministrations on the following Sabbath were such as caused me to drop this conclusion. I believe I shall have a glorious presence of God with me through my whole ministry. And God so strangely inclined the hearts of the people in our congregation that besides their weekly collections every Lord's Day, they did about this time subscribe about 70 pounds for my encouragement in my public service the ensuing year. Footnote. Cotton Mather was not ordained a colleague to his father in the church until May 13th, 1685. His uncle Nathaniel wrote, I had forgot to say to yourself by any means, get to preach without any use or of help by your notes. When I was in N.E., no man that I remember used them except one, and he, because of a special infirmity, the vertigo as I take it, or some species of it. Neither of your grandfathers used any, nor did your uncle Samuel here, nor do I, though we both of us write generally the materials of all our sermons. Back to the narrative. March 13th, Lord's Day. Coming home from the public service, wherein I enjoy the special assistances of God, I wrote these words. I believe that I am a chosen vessel, and that the Lord will pour mercy unto me, till I have arrived unto a fullness of eternal glory. Lord, help me to serve thee, love thee, glorify thy name. Fill me with thy spirit. It will be so. O oh, who am I that I should be filled with the spirit of the holy God? But it will be so. The Lord has caused his servant to trust in his word. Isaiah 44, verse 3. This day in the assurance the glorious and ravishing assurance of the divine love, my joys were almost insupportable. March 19th. Three weeks are not past since my keeping a secret fast before the Lord, and now on the very same accounts I keep another. My essays to cast myself upon the mercy of God in Jesus Christ this day were attended with wonderful assurances that the Lord was mine, and that I should be his forever. Yea, I feel the Lord Jesus Christ most sensibly carrying on the interests of his kingdom in my soul continually. The day following, the twentieth, having been thrown into much weakness and faintness by the extraordinary devotions wherein I had been laboring, Satan made it unto me an occasion of many discouraging fears that I should not be able to go through the work which was the Lord's day before me. 
But I earnestly cried unto the Lord, saying, Lord, I know not what to do, but my eyes are unto thee. Thou art a master most able and ready to help thy poor servants. O let thy strength appear in my weakness, and being strong in the Lord, let me be carried now beyond myself. Lord, thou hast said that will be with thy disciples to the end of the world. I apply that word, I rely on thee, I believe that will enable me to glorify thy name. In the strength of this faith, I went into the great congregation, and the Lord gave me such remarkable and even unusual assistances that I saw cause then to enter this advice. Remember, O my soul, that when I am going about the work of my dear Master, the Lord Jesus Christ, thou art then to depend on him for strength. Fear nothing, thou shalt be strong. April the 3rd, Lord's Day this day the Lord put it into my heart to make this prayer before him, that he would give me to write something that may do service for the Lord Jesus Christ among young persons, and I was persuaded that I should live to do it. April 8th I found my soul under strong distempers, and especially an idle frame of soul, was a plague upon me. Upon this occasion I fell into an exceeding bitterness of spirit. And I was filled with fears that the Spirit of God was going to take a sad farewell of me. This agony of my mind set me upon prayer, but in prayer I found myself horribly straitened. Nor could I find any promise that I could lay hold upon. Yea, I could not go unto the Lord Jesus Christ, nor do anything to rescue myself out of the most shattered and confused condition in the world. I saw there was no peace to be had if the Lord spoke it not. And I saw that it was a dangerous thing to give way unto anything that may grieve the Spirit of God. The Lord is grinding me to pieces for the frames of soul wherein I have allowed myself. But after all, I will, thought I, do these things first. I will not absolutely conclude that the Lord intends me hurt in my desertions. He has done and will do the same good unto me by them that by other afflictions. I believe that when the Lord had broken me and fitted me for further mercy and laid me low before him, he will raise me up and bestow of great comfort on me and employ me in great service for him. Secondly, I will not slacken my seeking the face of God, though now when I try to pray I am so full of darkness, horror, and confusion that I am not able to pray as formally, yet when I can't pray I'll groan. There is, and it may be, or a who knows, or, or who can tell. But the Lord may pity me and relieve me. The day following, my confusions continued. And though I made attempts at prayer, yet a disconsolate heart that I had could make no work of it. I considered. I was never sufficiently sensible both of my vileness and weakness before the Lord, and I never enough prized his consolations. Now I thought the good God will rectify my spirit. I considered also, perhaps the Lord is trying which way my spirit will work and whither I will go for help and joy. But Lord, thou art my fountain, and I am resolved in thy strength that though thou grindest me to powder, I will never leave thee. Though thou killest me, I will put my trust in thee. I have worldly delights and contents enough, but, O oh, my Lord, they will not do. After some further meditations, I went before the Lord, and my departed strength returned something to me. At last I said, Lord, this has been the counsel that in thy name I have given to discouraged souls when speaking to them in the great congregation. If they could not believe, yet let them try what they could do and stretch out their withered hands. And Lord, this course I will follow, this counsel I will take myself. O thou mighty Savior, who has hid all the ends of earth to look unto thee, and said that thou wilt cast out none of those that come unto thee, O oh, I am helpless. But I look unto thee, I come unto thee, I undertake for me, deliver me, I believe thou wilt. Lord, help my unbelief. My diseases are so complicated that I am not able so much as distinctly to mention them unto thee. Much less can I remedy them. 
Only thou art my support, and the Lord Jesus Christ shall have all the glory. So my heart was quieted. April 2nd, the Lord's Day. This day my enlarged heart used these expressions in prayer before the Lord. Lord, spare my life, but if thou dost call me out of this veil of tears, I am willing to die and come unto thee. Nevertheless, if it be thy will, I would live to do some special service for thee before I shall go hence and be no more. Yea, let me do something, and in thy time let me write something that may do good to young persons when I shall be dead and gone. April 16th. This day I set apart for solemn humiliation and earnest supplication in secret before the Lord my unsuitable and unsanctified frames under the most wonderful mercies of God and the desertions which had lately darkened my soul were the things which drove me to these duties. And my special errands to the Lord were that he would speak peace unto me and that he would give me strength to overcome the distempers of my heart and that he would prepare me for and employ me in some special service to his dearest name. Horrible agonies and amazements took hold of my soul this day when I was, as in the beginning of such days I ever used to be, entertaining myself with the manifold instances of my sinfulness and wretchedness. After the prayers were ending, things were amplified, sitting in my chair, I had such thoughts as these. What intends my Lord to do with my soul? Why does he thus grind and break my heart, and upon every turn cast me into unutterable anguishes? Oh, surely he will sweeten heaven to me at the last. Yea, blessed be the name of the great God. I know that I am entered at the straight gate, and walking in the narrow way. After this, a saying to go unto the Lord Jesus Christ, I found that I could not believe on him. So I cried earnestly unto God, even as for my life, that he would help me to believe. And, oh, blessed be his name, he did help me with a moved, melted, raised soul. I laid hold on the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, Lord, though I am lamentably full of mercies, yet blessed be thy name, there is a Christ in whom there is a fountain set open for me. And now, Lord, thou hast bidden me to go unto him. It is thy commandment that I should believe. My Lord Jesus Christ has also encouraged me with his gracious invitations and has told me he will in no wise cast me out. O blessed words, what shall I now do but come? Lord, at thy bidding I come, and I will sit down satisfied. I know that the Lord Jesus Christ is both an able and a faithful Savior, and by him I shall be saved from my sins. That that is the one thing which I have desired, and that I will seek after, even that my iniquities may be subdued, and that I may be sanctified as well as pardoned. And oh, what a glorious word is this! It belongs unto my Lord Redeemer now to destroy all my sins. Why doth he call for my heart? Is it not that he might work all his own works in it? Why does he knock at the door of my soul? Is it not that he may come in to set up his kingdom there? And is that it, O Lord? O let that blessed thing be done. And now I believe I shall be saved, being a sheep in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. I never shall miscarry. These passages I recite the more distinctly, that so having been thus in my youth taught of God, I may do something towards the teaching of my children, or others with whom I may leave these papers, the way of salvation by Jesus Christ. This day also I received an assurance from the Lord that I should yet live to do some great services for him. May 10th This day being taken with a violent pain in my back and side, which looked like a messenger of death, I wrote the following. Thoughts Oh, the hardness of my heart! If mercies could have softened or quickened me, I should not have been as I am, but there is desperate wickedness from which I am yet uncleansed. I have sometimes thought I should never come to this pass, when in secret places my filled soul has been satisfied with the communion of the blessed God. But nothing will now work in me. Oh, I am fit for sickness as ever any poor creature was, fit in the same sense that a rotten stump is fit for the fire. 
and, Lord, shall I never be awakened until I feel the heavy blows of thy hand? However, I have this to say, first, Lord, thou canst rectify my spirit every way without such bitter corrections as I have reason to expect. Next, Lord, yet if thou wilt afflict me, yet if I may be brought thereby to see thee more and love thee more, I submit, here I am, afflict me, do what thou wilt with me, kill me, for thy grace has me made willing to die. Only, only, only help me to delight in thee and to glorify thy dearest name. So filthy a wretch as I, who continually grieves the good spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, and grow proud and vain when he does exalt me with his favors, have caused to mention his assistances unto me with a very trembling soul. And what shall I make of this instance? There was an honest man in the town, whom I lovingly and frequently rebuked for his neglecting to join himself unto some church of the Lord Jesus Christ. His indisposition thereunto continuing, I told him, Well, the God of heaven has by his word been calling upon you. Expect now to have him speak unto you by a blow. A few days after this, the honest man fell down from the top of an house and received a blow, whereof he lay for some weeks as dead. But coming to himself, one of the first things he thought of was what I had said to him under the same sense in which he quickly went and joined himself under the South Church. May 14th, 1681 This day I saw that I had great cause to humble myself in fasting and prayer before the Lord, and accordingly I set apart the day. Because first... My old iniquities might make me walk softly in the bitterness of my soul all the days of my life. Oh, I was never enough humbled for them. Number two, my late infirmities have been very grievous. My proud, my want, and my slothful heart fearfully testifies against me. Number three, the Lord has been so provoked as to withdraw the light of his countenance from me and leave me in a condition of heavy darkness. Number four, I am as unprofitable a creature as almost any I know of in the world. Number five, times of trouble are coming, and I need yet the mark of God upon me. For these causes I devoted the day unto the Lord, that I might abase myself before him, and implore his blessings in all respects upon me. This day I thus renewed my closure with the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I am a vile sinner and which my soul melts at the mention of, Thou art justly angry with me. But oh, for a reconciliation, Lord, is there no hope in Israel? Yes, thou hast opened the door of hope. And what a word is that which thou hast spoken? Thou dost even beseech sinners to be reconciled unto thyself. Is that so? Lord, I am willing to be reconciled unto thee. My very soul desires to love thee and love thy ways and walk therein always, even unto the end. But is there not a Jesus who delivers from the wrath to come? A Jesus? Lord, my soul now lives and melts at the remembrance of that sweet name. A Jesus who is a mighty Savior. To him I go, and Lord, it is at thy bidding that I go. It is he that formally invited me, formally encouraged me, formally assisted me to come unto him. And I formally have also found it good for me so to do. He calls even such as I am, and solemnly professes that he will not cast them out when they come unto him. Lo, then I come, I bring my soul unto him, O let him save me. Is not he a priest, a prophet, a king? Now, now I have enough, my soul needs no more. He will be these to me, and therefore he will be all to me. And now I am satisfied, though my case be so very bad, and though my distempers are so very strong, that I am in myself an utter loss how to relieve myself. Yet he will be my undertaker. I will rejoice in that Lord and in his salvation. He will carry on the works which he has begun, till the times of refreshing do come from the presence of the Lord. My heart was this day also melted with a marvelous assurance that I should enjoy much of the divine presence with me in my ministry. May 16th. Choosing for the sake of some conveniences to retire for my studies into our spacious meeting house, I had a strong impression on my mind there to make a prayer in one of the pews, and particularly in a pew belonging to one Mr. Middlecott, a gentleman 
of good fashion and quality in our neighborhood, but one of an airy temper, and not yet making much show of acquaintances with the ways of God, nor indeed was he any other than a stranger to myself. Here I cried unto the Lord for this gentleman, who was the owner of the pew, that the Lord would work thoroughly and savingly on his heart, and make him a really renewed person, and let me live to see the answer of these my prayers. And I had my heart filled with a strange and a strong hope that my prayers would at one time or other be graciously answered. Memorandum About eleven years afterwards I saw the answer of these prayers when the very gentleman joined unto our church and proved himself in further instances a pious person and a great blessing and comfort unto myself. June 4th. This morning as I was going, for I knew not what myself, into one of our chambers, I accidentally took up a book lying there, which was Mr. H. Lucan's of Prayer. Henry Lucan, footnote, 1628-1719, to a nonconformist divine whose The Interest of the Spirit in Prayer was printed in London in 1674 and again in 1678. Back to the narrative. There I lit upon this passage. Some men go to market only for company and curiosity, and such are soon weary of being there, and may come home as soon as they please. But those that are men of much business and great dealing have many occasions to take up their time, which cause them many times to stay late. Formal Christians have little to do with God when they come to Him only for company or custom. But a serious Christian that understands the business of Christianity has so much to do when he comes to the throne of grace and the favor of God to desire towards any so many particular cases and on so many occasions that he hardly knows how to get away. These words to me were like a rebuke of thunder. I thought they came to me as if the Lord from heaven had intended me an admonition for the slothfulness, the lukewarmness, a formality which I saw was of late grown upon me in the ways of God, and I hope not without some impression. June 6th. This day a good woman bewailed unto me her condition on the score of woeful thoughts pestering her mind. She told me she was rendered afraid of her condition because I had lately given it as one mark of an effectually called person to have the heart filled with new thoughts. These words of hers were blessed by God unto my own awakening, for upon reflection I found that I had of late been dogged with proud thoughts in almost all I did. My heart grew full of distress, lest the unreasonable pride should provoke the God of heaven to deal terribly with me. In a sermon preached this week by my father about the sin of pride, I thought I heard and wrote as my own condemnation. The apprehensions of the cursed pride, the sin of young ministers lurking and working in my heart, filled me with much bitterness and confusion before the Lord, and caused me to resolve that before the week was out, I would set apart a day to humble myself before God for the pride of my own heart and entreat that by his grace I may be delivered from that sin and from all the dreadful wrath whereto I have been by that sin exposed, which accordingly I attended. June 11th. This day I set apart for prayer with fasting before the Lord, and I did endeavor to humble myself this day as for my unprofitableness in every relation and my other manifold corruptions, thus especially for my pride with the several manifestations of it. Concerning my pride, I examined myself by all the discoveries of it, but I found especially two respects wherein I was most woefully guilty before the Lord. First, my applauding of myself and my thoughts when I have done anything at all significant, prayed or preached with enlargements answered a question readily, presently, suitably, and the like. Proud thoughts fly below my best performances. Next, my ambitious affectation of preeminences, far above what can belong to my own age or worth, and above others that are far more deserving than myself. For my humiliation, I then wrote these considerations. Number one. How does my pride render me without the image of God? It is indeed the very image of Satan on my soul. 
The more any man has of God in him, the more humble will he be, and low, and vile in his own eyes, and empty of himself. When the Lord renews his image in us, he pulls down our proud thoughts. It is true my pride is the most natural sin, but grace would overcome that in a most special manner and measure. And then how little grace have I, how unlike am I to the Lord Jesus Christ, the lowly one. Oh, let me for this cause abhor myself in dust and ashes. Number two, do I not by my pride grievously offend the Lord? It is a breach of his holy command. And how often does he declare his abhorrence of it? Psalm 138, verse 6, Proverbs 6, 17, Habakkuk 2, verse 4. His Holy Spirit is thereby grieved, and how vehemently does the Spirit caution against all tendencies thereunto? Shall I bear to think of offending that God who has been a father to me, and whom I have chosen and vowed that I would love and serve as my God? Or that Spirit upon the sweet influences whereof my soul does live, sealed unto the day of redemption? Oh, the inexcusable wickedness of my heart! Number three. Is not my pride a most unreasonable folly and madness? Have I any just occasion for glorying in myself? Do I anything singular? Am not I in most attainments succeeded by most of my calling and standing? But oh, let this be a dagger to my heart. Have I not a cursed nature in me, and has not the Lord heretofore justly left me unto some abominable iniquities and sins whereof should cause me to walk softly all my days? Lord, I am viler than a beast before thee. Or why should I seek honor? Am I fit for any service? Am I not rather unsavory, salt, fit for nothing but the dunghill? What am I better than the least of saints? If in any external grandeurs I get above them, I am thereby obnoxious to more temptations of sin and wrath. Lie then in the dust before God, O oh my soul. Number four. How dangerous, how destructive and evil is this pride of mine. I provoke the God of heaven to take away every one of those idols which in my fond pride I dote upon. And if the Lord should not deprive me of my capacities and my opportunities, where am I but in a horrid pit of most unpitiable miseries? Yea, let me remember, pride sooner than anything will drive away the good spirit of God from the heart of a poor creature. And if that should be my fate, O Lord, have mercy. What a monument should I be of that ireful and thy direful vengeance? O oh, that the Lord would set home thee thoughts for my humiliation. But what shall I do for the cure of my disease, number one? In the first and chief place, I would carry my distempered heart unto the Lord Jesus Christ and put it into the hands of that all-sufficient physician for him to cure it. Number two. I would be daily watchful against my pride and continually keep an eye upon my heart and check the very beginnings and first motions of the corruption. Number three. I would study much the nature, manner, and aggravations of this evil and the excellency of the grace that is contrary thereunto. In the supplications which this day I spread before the Lord, I was not without his assistances especially when I was crying unto the Lord about and against my lust of pride, which had this day brought me unto the dust. In one prayer I said, Lord, what shall I do for the cure of this disease? My pride. Blessed be thy name, that thou hast showed me a way, and bid me walk in it. Have I not heard thee say unto my stung and swollen and sinful soul, O oh, look, and be saved, and therefore by thy grace I'll do it. I have done it, and found, yea, to this day, I find a benefit of it. Why is it that I am not insensibly and incurably forever carried away captive by the loss which I am now warring with? It is because I have put my heart into the hands of the faithful Jesus, and he it is that has not suffered me to go on unconcerned about the distemper of my soul, but has awakened me to seek relief at his hands as I do this day. And now, Lord, I come unto him. He sees how I am laboring and heavy laden, but he has bid me come. Does not he call for my heart? But what kind of heart? It is not mentioned, but I am sure it is my heart that is called for. Hence, though my heart be a proud heart, yet as long as it is mine, I am to bring it. Yea, O Lord, I bring it because it is proud. 
And why does he call for it? Is it not that he may set up his kingdom in it and fill it with his graces and manifest a power of his rich goodness in it forever? Oh, then let him take my heart and make it humble. It is easy with him to do it. Though I can't overcome this pride of mine, yet he can do it. Oh, let him do it. I wait upon him for it. Yea, I do believe I am satisfied and assured that he will do it. I have not sought thy face in vain. And in some of my further prayers, the Lord gave me glorious assurances that he would never leave the works which he had begun in my soul, but fill me with his own most Holy Spirit and guide me by his counsel till he brought me to his glory, and that he would uphold me graciously in my ministry, yea, that he would employ me to do peculiar services for his blessed name. June 18th. At the last week I kept a day of supplication, so I was desirous this week to keep a day of thanksgiving in secret places before the Lord. I never knew of any person or heard of more than one person who did accustom themselves unto such an exercise. But the good spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ having taken possession of my sinful heart, I became inclined and instructed unto such methods of religion as were now before me. I was now taught of God thus to spend this day. First, to recollect the merciful dispensations of God unto me. Secondly, to consider the aggravations of those mercies and the greatness and the freeness of them. Thirdly, to register them in my memorials. And fourthly, to acknowledge them in my devotions. Number five, to contrive what returns I should make by way of gratitude unto the Lord. Accordingly, after prayers for assistance, I meditated over the former kindnesses of the Lord unto me, which I have already recorded in my former manuscripts, and returned my most hearty and solemn thanks unto the Lord on the account thereof. Especially my soul was moved when saying, Lord, has thou not pulled me out of the horrible pit and awakened me to look after the Lord Jesus Christ with the sight of my misery without him? Has thou not helped me to come unto my Lord Redeemer, and feel the begun and blessed benefit thereof, and his healing of me, when my soul has been endangered by diseases that have been undiscovered? Whose works are those that have been done upon my soul? Have I done those great things on my own behalf? O Lord, not unto me, not unto me, but unto thy name is all, all, all the glory due, and thou shalt have it. There shall alleluias be sung to thee for ever and ever. This is a sample from the diary of Cotton Mather for the year 1681. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan hard drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable, and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, 
soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that 